Well, in the so-called Badlands neighborhood of Philadelphia, a few years ago there was a sign hanging off of the building at St. Edward's Cathedral, and St. Edward's Cathedral had been shut down and abandoned for a number of years. But the sign hanging outside had the words on it, how can we worship a homeless man on Sunday and ignore one on Monday? And inside the cathedral at the time were about 40 families without homes, mostly mothers and children, who had recently moved into this abandoned church facility. Now, the church officials who owned the property made it known to the newest residents of the cathedral that they had 48 hours to move out or face arrest. And this story caught the attention of a young man named Shane Claiborne. He was a college student about 20 miles away at the time, and now he's one of the leading figures in a movement that's called the New Monastics. So Shane Claiborne and a few dozen of his college friends organized and decided that they were going to move into St. Edward's Cathedral with the families without homes saying to the community around them, if you're coming to take them, you're taking us too. So the story generated a little media attention and some residents of the city and some activists, some media showed up, and on the day when church officials came to evict the families from the cathedral, they arrived and saw the crowds and got back in their cars and went home. And for many weeks thereafter, these college students and these families without homes lived together in community, worshiping, eating together, and they had a variety of visitors. Against their orders, some priests showed up and served Mass to the families there. When the church authorities said that they were going to use fire code violations as a way to hasten the eviction, the families heard loud knocks on the doors in the middle of the night and opened it frightened to find a group of firefighters who said, we're not here to kick you out, we're here to make sure the building passes inspection. Putting in smoke detectors and changing wires and risking their entire careers in this move. It was this kind of experience that led Shane Claiborne and six other friends to start an intentional Christian community in the Kensington neighborhood of Philadelphia, one of the poorest parts of the city, and they started in a row house that's just blocks away from that cathedral. This community calls itself the Simple Way. They live together in a row house, sharing all they have, working part-time jobs, but they have plenty to sustain what they need there, and they engage the community. They say they reclaim abandoned spaces of empire, is the phrase they use. They take abandoned lots with syringes in them and turn them into community gardens, and they run a a mentoring and after-school program out of their home as well as a community store where for a dollar you can get a bag of clothes or a piece of furniture. And to me, their work is beautiful and challenging and risky and dangerous and, quite honestly, often illegal. The city has passed laws that said it was illegal to share food with homeless people on the streets, a law they break regularly, and they have no permits or permission for their after-school programs or community gardens. Now, to try and imagine a part of a U.S. city with thousands of abandoned houses in it. The neighborhood that they're in has more abandoned homes than people without homes. To try and imagine a part of a city in the United States with thousands of abandoned homes in it is almost impossible for me to get my mind around, especially when we're sitting in this sanctuary. Located in a small city, one of the wealthiest cities, located in the wealthiest country in the world. It's hard for me to get my mind around what that looks like, especially when I know that the recent census data said that one out of every five people living in Dallas right now is living below the poverty line. One out of five. And that line is $23,000 a year for a family of four. Nearly half the residents of our surrounding community live in low-income homes. Is that what we're capable of? Is that the full extent of what we are capable of creating together as a people? This year, 
as part of our year of engagement and service, our community track, which is focused on the area, is asking us to engage in relationship and service around very basic human needs, food, shelter, and education. But I hope that in this talk about service, what you don't miss are the underlying spiritual questions. What's the difference between a group of people who live in the same place and a group of people who live in community? What's our power? What are we capable of doing? Are we really all in this together? And what am I as an individual willing to commit and promise to the places that I live and worship and work in? So I've been reading uh, books lately by an author named Peter Block, and he's, uh, he focuses on community building and civic engagement. And in his research, the kind of communities that transform lives and where people are actively engaged, he says, come out of a strong sense of belonging. Not just belonging to a place, but having it belong to you. He says, in communities where people are citizens, we feel as if we are co-owners and co-creators of the communities we inhabit. So let me ask you, how often do you feel like you're a co-owner and co-creator of the room you're in? The classroom, even the dinner table, the bus ride, the city square block, the church, the city. Why not? His work is rich and complex, but I'll try and sum up the qualities of an authentic community in a paragraph for you, at least what he says they are. He says that authentic communities happen when we focus on our gifts and not our deficiencies. He says that authentic community happens when we pull in gifts from the margin to the center. That authentic community happens when we talk as people about possibilities, not problems. When we gather in small groups to ask powerful and difficult questions of each other, and where every person in the community believes they are accountable for the well-being of every other person in the community, whether that community is a room, a dinner table, or a city. And he says that in community, we make explicit promises to each other, out loud about what we're willing to commit. He says not to worry too much because big communities start small, one room at a time, usually the room you're in. Now, I liked his stuff a lot, but I also recognize that it's not new. A few weeks ago when we were talking about the origins of Unitarian Universalism, I said in this sanctuary that our Universalist Christian ancestors believed that the purpose of religion wasn't getting people into heaven but rather getting heaven onto the earth. It's that old-time notion of the kingdom of God on earth, or what we might call beloved community on earth. You know the kind of questions and stories that come along with it, right? Am I my brother and sister's keeper? Do we belong to one another? Are we all in this together? As the rabbi said, I was hungry and you fed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you visited me. What you did to the least of my brothers and sisters, you did to me. I thought about that passage when I read the words from Maryland this morning and I'm inspired by the kind of community they've built at L'Arche. A community of people who know well that they are more than what they can't do. When she was asked to describe her community, she said, it's a place where they want you. Don't underestimate what a big deal that is. Now, all of the organizational developmental language aside and scriptural passages aside, I think Marilyn asked the question that we should be asking of one another when we try and build community. Are you going to keep me? Are we each other's keepers? What I hear from the L'Arche community and from the simple way and from Peter Block's work and religious teachers is that there is a fundamental difference between being a group of people who simply are in the same place at the same time 
and living in community. And how often do we accept the former as community? Simply existing together. You see, I don't think that this building is the church, and I don't think that when people come into the room, it makes it church. That's just us being in the same room at the same time. This place is church when we minister to each other. And you know, for a democratic faith, one thing that we, I think, struggle with sometimes is delegating all the ministerial stuff to the ministers. A good, healthy, vibrant, democratic institution is one where we minister to each other. But I wonder how many people in this room right now would walk around and answer yes to the question, do you often think of yourself as a minister to others? I think we are, but I think that label can seem abstract and far off for people who are simply trying to keep the day-to-day routine of their lives together or pay their bills or handle their relationships. I think the understanding that we walk around as potential ministers to one another gets lost in all of the petty labels we wear as consumers or Republicans or Democrats. And how often do we take that story on as if it's true that before we can be valid members of our community, we have to be prettier or thinner or richer or safer, that we're always just almost there or just past it too young, too old, too something. And I'll tell you that even as a person who publicly preaches against that kind of idea, I still struggle with that bad theology of never enough and the addiction that I have to blaming other people for the world not being the way I want it to be. It's so easy to delegate our ministry further and further out. I don't know if you'll believe this call, but I believe that you are not just able, but called to be responsible for the building of beloved community in the next room you inhabit, or possibly this one. And that to me is a very beautiful idea, but it's incredibly difficult. A call to be ministers to one another and builders of community means We're not engaging in a rose-colored glasses theology. If you want to be a minister to the people in the room with you, you have to pay attention, close attention to their suffering and their very real gift. You have to be willing to look face-to-face with your suffering and your very real gifts, and you have to be willing to be vulnerable and frail and imperfect and make mistakes, and we are challenged by that. Also, it means admitting that if we want to turn a collection of people into a meaningful relationship, any meaningful relationship asks something meaningful of us. Any good relationship, any good friendship, any good church, any good marriage, any good citizenship asks something difficult of you. Because Any community that promises you that you won't have to grow or do some soul searching or be accountable for the well-being of others or make explicit commitments out loud is not community, it's consumption. And we consume one another too much already. I wonder if we were to ask you to go home and reflect today on this question, what your answer would be. Believing that it is possible for you to turn whatever room you're in closer to being heaven on earth, what are you willing to risk to make that true? What's the risk, and what are you willing to risk? See, I think the most frightening thing about this possibility for all of us to be ministers to one another is that it's possible. That you don't need anything you don't currently have to be authorized to be a builder of beloved community. I love that excerpt from the sermon from Dr. King that Daniel read for us this morning where he says that you don't have to have a college degree to serve or minister to others. And you don't have to make your subject and your verb agree to serve and minister to others. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve and to minister to others. What you need, he says, is a heart full of grace 
and the soul generated by love. How often do we focus on what we don't have, who we're not, what we don't have yet, what we can't do? I mean, look at the places where community like this sacred, holy community can happen. It seems like the divine has a preference for the margins. It can happen in abandoned cathedrals with college students and homeless families. And it can happen in international communities of people living with severe disability, but who know that they are more than what they can't do. And it can and does happen here. And you are called to the work. I tell you, I know that when I start to get anxious and frustrated about what I believe we don't have in terms of money or resources or volunteers or a thousand things, I find it helpful to remind myself that the early church, the beginnings of one of the most powerful human movements in history, started with the teaching of a radical homeless Jewish teacher with 12 committed volunteers and no budget. No, 11 committed volunteers. In trying to describe the theology behind the Simple Way community, Shane Claiborne points to a comic strip that he read once that I think our ancestors and most of us in this room would like. In the comic strip, two men are walking down the road together having a conversation, and one friend turns to the other and says, I want to ask God a question. I want to know why God allows all this poverty and violence to exist in our world. His friend says, why don't you ask? He says, well, I'm afraid God will ask me the same question. I look out on this Sunday morning, and I see a room full of hundreds of people who are able, just as you are, to minister to one another and to minister to our city. Let's put this in perspective. If we were to call a public meeting of people in the Dallas area to show up who had a different vision for the future, who believed that we were all in this together, who were willing to be accountable for the well-being of all people in our area, and who wanted badly to love and serve one another in the name of justice. If we issued that invitation and this many people showed up, we would be ecstatic. And it just happened. We issue that invitation every single week and you have shown up. And this many people were here at the first service, and you will be here next week. It is a miracle. This work is not easy, and any ministry to others will be risky and powerful and dangerous. We have an invitation this year from our community track to be involved in relationships and service around very basic human needs, food, shelter, education. And I hope that you'll be involved in some of these projects, and I hope that you will also hear the invitation we are giving you to reimagine that you are ministers to one another, that you are capable builders of beloved community who have all the resources, time, talent, money and power and authority that you will ever need to turn the room you're in that much closer into being heaven on earth. I look out in this sanctuary and know very well that you are keepers. The invitation is to be keepers of one another. What better time than now? Amen.